the notion that these complicated biochemical structures couldn't have been produced by evolution has been championed by Michael Beattie. And Beattie has an idea that he calls irreducible complexity. And he says, you can't evolve these things because they're irreducibly complex. Notice what he says. An irreducibly complex system can't be produced the way that evolution works by numerous successive slight modifications of a precursor system because any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. These are multi-part systems. And he's basically telling you that the 30 or 40 proteins that are in here, they all have to be together and there's no function. And since natural selection does have to work gradually, I agree on that point, um, it can't produce 20, 25, 26 proteins knowing what will eventually happen because natural selection is blind, which is indeed absolutely true. So the poster child for intelligent design by any standard, it shows up so often it really could be called the poster child, is in fact the bacterial flagellum. This was mentioned so often in the trial that the judge, uh, probably from fatigue, got a little sarcastic about it. One of the attorneys said, Your Honor, when we reconvene, we're going to talk again about the bacterial flagellum. And the judge at one point said, Oh, goody. <laughs> The last expert witness for the Board of Education, a biochemist named Scott Minnick from the University of Idaho, was called up to the stands to talk about this. And since B, he had talked about it, the lawyers had talked about it, they had argued about it, and I had talked about it, as I'm going to show you here for a second, Minnick got up there and he said he was going to talk about the bacterial flagellum. And the judge, the judge deadpan, well, we've heard that before. And Minnick turned to him, this is the best line of the trial, Minnick turned to him and said, you know, Your Honor, I sort of feel like Zsa Zsa Gabor's fifth husband. I know what to do, I just don't know how to make it exciting. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I take my hat off to Scott. That was good. I like that. Um, so what, what is this argument about? Here, here's the argument in very simplified form. Um, if you have a complex, multi-part biochemical machine composed of many parts, its function everyone agrees, can be favored by natural selection. But the argument is that evolution can't produce them because the individual parts have no function of their own. That's what irreducible complexity means. So natural selection can't make this, doesn't have any function. Can't make that, can't make that. Um, therefore, you can't evolve a structure like this. Now, how does evolution explain something like that? Well, ever since Darwin, we've had a very good explanation. Um, and that is these complicated machines, they don't arise from scratch. They arise from combinations of components that have different functions, functions of their own, and the components originate with functions of their own as well. Therefore, natural selection will work every step of the way. Now, that's not evidence, that's just an argument. But the beauty of this is we can now hold these two ideas up against each other, and we can say, who's right? If irreducible complexity is right, then the parts of these machines should be absolutely useless. But if evolution is right, we should be able to take these machines, look at their parts, and discover, wow, they do other jobs. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's take the bacterial flagellum. So if we start with the flagellum, here it is. And these drawings name the genes and the proteins in the flagellum. And we say, let's take away a whole bunch of the parts. How many? Um, not one, not five, not ten. Let's take 40 of its 50 parts away. Now watch very carefully, because I'm going to do that experiment right there. There it goes. The parts are all gone. And I have left 10 parts that span the membrane. What are left behind are 10 proteins in the base of the flagellum. Now, if irreducible complexity is right, this should be absolutely functionless. It should have no function. But if you will pardon the double negative, what is left behind is not non-functional. What is left behind is the type 3 secretory system, and it is fully functional. I know most of you in the room are going, of course, the type 3 secretory system. <laughs> The type 3 secretory system is a molecular syringe in which some of the nastiest protein uh, 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 bacteria on this planet produce toxic proteins, grab onto one of our cells, and inject those proteins into our cells. The bacteria that causes bubonic plague works this way. It's really nasty stuff. Well, guess what? The 10 proteins that make up the type 3 secretory system are directly homologous to the 10 proteins in the base of the bacterial flagellum. They don't produce movement. They're not a flagellum. But are they functional? They are fully functional. So remember that claim. Any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. 
This guy is missing 40 parts, and it is perfectly functional. What that means, there's no other word for it, is that that statement is wrong. And that's not an incidental statement. That is the heart and soul of the intelligent design argument. And in this case, it turns out to be wrong. Now, it's even longer than that, because it turns out that not only do these proteins make up the type 3 secretory apparatus, but almost every protein in the bacterial flagellum is strongly homologous to proteins that have other functions elsewhere in the cell. And what that means is when we look at this wonderful icon of intelligent design, a careful analysis of the flagellum actually matches evolutionary theory, namely the parts should have functions of their own and not the intelligent design prediction. And that's simply a fact. Devastating, huh? So, what's, uh, is there any possible solution to that? I mean, he just creamed Fahey, didn't he? I mean, he's a very creative speaker, he's a very entertaining speaker, and he makes good sense. If you just first approach it just like he does, he's nailed Fahey, it seems to me. So, what, what would be my comeback? Let me ask you, based on Kenneth Miller's argument, here's the type 3 secretory system, the toxin injector, and here's the flagellum. Which would you think came first, evolved first? This one, yes or no? Yeah. This one evolved first, based on Kenneth Miller's argument, right? And then this one, after that, because it had the add-on parts, and then finally you got to this, right? So you would think this would evolve first if you thought Kenneth Miller's argument was true, right? Everybody think that's right? Okay, makes sense. Let me tell you, the flagellum is found in many kinds of bacteria. However, the toxin injector is restricted to a few pathogenic gram-negative bacteria that can attack plants and animals, which are thought to have come along billions of years after flagellar motility. Does that make sense? From Kenneth Miller's perspective? So here's a paper published by Anugin and, and others. They write, there is little similarity or homology to anything within, within less complex motility systems, only homology to the flagellum subset with that toxin injector to the flagellum subset. Several scientists have promoted the idea that the TTS system evolved from the fully formed flagellar system, not the other way around. Does that make sense given what Miller said? No, but it makes sense from a creationist perspective because which is easier? Is it easier to break Humpty Dumpty or to put them back together again? Break him, right? Is it easier to break him with a little few shreds of him that might still work for a little while by themselves? Right? It's easier... Is it easier to like break your engine block and your car doesn't run anymore but your lights still work for a while? Right? Does that mean your motility system of your car is not irreducible? Yes. Right? The motility system requires a certain number of parts to be there at the same time for your car to run as a motility vehicle instead of a giant flashlight. <laughs> right? Same thing with the flagellum. You can break the flagellum up, but will the motility system still work? No, it requires at least 40 parts to be there at the same time in specific arrangement for the motility function to work. Notice that Kenneth Miller removed 40 of the 50, he started with 50, he removed 40 of the 50 proteins and to get stuck with the 10, amino, uh, 10 protein system of the toxin injector. Why didn't he just remove one? Because it doesn't do anything. It doesn't, that's a huge gap. Going from 10 to, uh, to 50, that's not just amino acids we're talking about. That's 40 entire proteins as a gap. Okay? Now, his argument is that you've got, you've got a chunk here of 10, you've got a chunk there of 10 you know, doing something else. You've got a chunk here of 5 and a chunk over here of 2 or 3, and then all these chunks come together. What are the odds that all the chunks will come together? Well, it's better, it is better than the odds that something completely random will come together, like a single amino acid just zooming all together. It's better than those odds. But is it good enough odds for it to come together this side of a trillion years of time? No. If you actually sit down and do the math, which he does not, the odds that it will come together across even a couple protein gap, even one protein gap, crossing a, a single protein gap that's, that's fairly specified uh, or at least a system gap that requires more than 1,000 fairly specified amino acid residues coming together at the same time, just a small gap like that, not 50 or 40 whole proteins, that requires trillions and trillions and trillions, trillions to the power of trillions of years. 
It's amazing. But these guys do not sit down and do the math. They're biologists. They think given two billion years of time, the impossible becomes possible. They don't sit down and actually do the science. They just sit down and make up these stories about how it's likely to happen given enough time. And they don't actually see if two billion years is en enough time. Two billion years is a drop in the bucket, statistically, if you actually do the math. A bit about the mechanism of evolution. Random mutations, are they real? Do random mutations happen? Yes, yes they're real. Do they affect DNA? Yes. Uh, they must be inheritable to be passed on to your children. Right? So they have mutations just can't be random anywhere in your body cells. They have to be random mutations in your gametes, in your sexually reproductive cells, in order to be passed on. Natural selection, is it a real force of nature? Yes. It's a real force of nature. Is it does it care about you? No. It's mindless, it's brutal, it has no goal in mind. However, it is capable of detecting phenotypic changes where the phenotypic change uh, has a different uh, what, by, what I mean by phenotype is the gross appearance. The genotype is the DNA. The phenotype is the body, right? So if you have a genotypic change in your DNA that makes a, a physical change in your body and you don't survive well enough to produce any kids, are you going to make any kids? No. So it's called the whole uh, Darwin Awards. You know, If you're stupid enough to die before you make kids, then uh, your whole offspring are gone, right? So it's a real force of nature. DNA. DNA is made up of four chemical letters, and they're adenine, thymine, and they're just labeled by these letters to make it more simple. But it's four chemical letters, and how many uh, chemical or how many symbols do computers work with? Two, right? Zeros and ones. So DNA is more or less complicated than computers as far as the language. A little more. But what about humans? We use how many uh, letters in the English language system? 26. So What's wrong with us? With our do we really need 26 letters to do? You know, you know, computers can do it with two. DNA can do just as complicated stuff with four letters. So it doesn't matter the number of symbols, really. No, it just matters how they're arranged, right? Information is coded by the sequential, sequential order of the chemical letter, similar to the English language system, Morse code, or other language systems, even, even computer codes. It's, a, it's all the same basic concept. Okay? Transcription and translation. How do you get the information out of DNA? You have to copy it into a working copy called messenger RNA, and that is called transcription. It transcribes it. It's still the same information. There's only one little letter difference between RNA and DNA, but otherwise it's the same basic principle, still based on four letters. And then how do you get the information from RNA to functional structural proteins? You translate it. It's, proteins are based on how many letters? 20. So if 20 proteins are based on 20 different amino acids, so that's kind of like 20 different letters. So it's a different language system, so you have to translate from the language of DNA to the language of proteins. Does that word make sense? So you have a, a whole structural apparatus that's able to take the letter in the uh, messenger RNA and then translate it into a letter in the protein language system. Okay? It's complicated. So this is kind of how it's done. You've got a string of DNA or, and converts to RNA. And then these are the string of proteins that result based on a reading of a three-character frame of reference. So these are called codons. So they're like words, DNA words. And each little word translates into a single protein, or a single amino acid, sorry. And then the, stretch, the string of amino acids is a protein. And then the protein gets folded up into a three-dimensional shape. 